I'm Scott Beardsley, Dean of the University of Virginia Darden School of Business. I would like to welcome you to the Leadership Unscripted Speaker Series. These events were typically hosted at University of Virginia's Darden DC Metro campus, Darden's new facility in the Washington DC area, and for now are brought to you via Zoom. The Leadership Unscripted series features candid dialogues with global leaders on a variety of thought-provoking topics. This year, the central theme of the speaker series focuses on women and gender, featuring top women leaders creating impact in their fields and in the world. COVID-19 is an extraordinary test of leadership and women in global leadership positions are rising to meet the challenge. Numerous news stories in Forbes, the Washington Post, and other media outlets have chronicled how many countries with successful coronavirus responses are being led by women, how female world leaders are being hailed as voices of reason during the COVID-19 crisis, and are also exploring why women make great leaders during this unprecedented time. We are so fortunate today to have two such world leaders. Mary Robinson is former president of Ireland and Hatla Thomas' daughter is former candidate for president of Iceland and CEO of the B team. They are uniquely positioned to speak on this topic given their broad range of experiences and advocacy of principled leadership and gender balance in the political, social, and entrepreneurial arenas. It is my pleasure to introduce them to you today. First, let me welcome the Honorable Mary Robinson, who served as President of Ireland from 1990 to 1997. Mary is Adjunct Professor for Climate Justice at Trinity College Dublin and Chair of the Elders. She also served as United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights from 1997 to 2002. She is a Club of Madrid member and the recipient of numerous honors and awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom from former President of the United States, Barack Obama. Between 2013 and 2016, Mary served as the United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy in three, in three different roles. First, for the Great Lakes region of Africa, then on climate change, and most recently as his special envoy on El Nino and climate. Her memoir, Everybody Matters, was published in September 2012. Her book, Climate Justice, Hope, Resilience, and the Fight for a Sustainable Future was published in September 2018. It is also my pleasure to welcome Hatla Thomas' daughter, former candidate for president of Iceland and CEO of the B Team. The B Team is a group of courageous business and civil society leaders working together to transform business for a better world. Hatla started her leadership career in corporate America, working for Mars and Pepsi-Cola. She was on the founding team of Reykjavik University, where she established the Executive Education Department, founded and led a successful women's entrepreneurship and empowerment initiative, and was an assistant professor at the business school. She was the first female CEO of the Iceland Chamber of Commerce, and later went on to co-found an investment firm with the vision to incorporate, incorporate feminine values into finance. In 2016, Hatla was an independent candidate for the president of Iceland. She entered a crowded field of candidates and finished as the runner up. I'd like to thank both of you for your willingness to share your insights on leadership in times of crisis, an incredibly important topic for our time. Each of you will share some remarks and then take questions. And I invite those of you on the Zoom to enter questions into the Q&A feature. Hatla, we will begin with you. 
Thank you, Dean Beardsley, and to the UVA community for welcoming Mary and me here today. And Mary, I think we should live up to the theme of the series and make this as unscripted and informal as possible. And, um, but I think, you know, if I could ask you to maybe first put on your elder's hat and really think about kind of how the world, 2020, what a year this has been, and we're not even halfway there. Uh, and from climate change to COVID to the protests in the streets, what do you see as the global challenges and opportunities in this moment? Well, you know, the interesting thing is, Hala, and of course it's lovely to have this conversation with you. Um, the interesting thing is I was quite depressed last January because it was the start of the year 2020 when we were to see great ambition, uh, especially from governments, to meet the challenge of the COP that was to take place in Glasgow in November, which has now been put off to next year. And uh, we had the report of the scientists, the IPCC, about staying at 1.5 degrees of warming. And that meant we had to reduce by 45% our carbon emissions by 2030. And in January, that was 10 years away. It's less than that now. And I couldn't see governments prepared to step up with the ambition. And then we got this awful crisis of COVID-19, devastating, devastating and so unequal. I mean, I've heard some people talk about it as a great leveler. Oh, it isn't. It, is, it actually exacerbates the inequalities and the intersectionality between those inequalities, you know, between poverty, inequality, race, gender, being a migrant or a refugee, being a person of disability, being locked in an abusive household, being a girl out of school could be pushed into child marriage. All of those inequalities are exacerbated. And at the same time, in a curious way, I'm less down and depressed because I see an opening. Because what COVID-19 has done, it, it has, first of all, it has shown us our vulnerability as a human race, that actually we do depend on nature and we do depend on not having a pandemic that can cause such destruction. And then briefly, the kind of lessons from the pandemic, from, from COVID. First of all, that it's our behavior, our collective behavior, that is the only thing between us and a much worse illness and death. By complying with lockdown, by complying with social distancing, washing our hands and all the other things, um, we are preventing the virus, for which we have no vaccine at the moment, from affecting those more vulnerable, and also the care workers and the health workers who are in the front line. So that's one lesson. A second lesson is that science matters. And that has not been enough of a lesson in the climate space. How often the children marching in their Fridays for Future have said, don't listen to us, we're only children. Listen to the science. But governments weren't listening to what the IPCC said and what they had to do. And the third thing is that government matters. And I was glad to hear the Dean mention earlier uh, the success of women-led governments. It's true. I mean, from Angela Merkel in Germany to the prime ministers of Norway, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, your country, uh, to uh, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, the president of, Thailand, of um, uh, uh, Taiwan. Um, I mean, it's, it's really remarkable because they took tough decisions. They listened to the scientists and they led their people very holistically into what needed to be done and are still doing so and are coming out more quickly out of the crisis. And the, the fourth thing, which I do think is quite important, is we have learned about compassion. You know, it, it, it's true that when you're suffering, you're more open to the suffering of others. And although the suffering is not equal, still there is that sense of uh, just being aware of the fact that we have a terrible crisis that has it's a health crisis, it's an economic crisis, it's an instability crisis. Um, and, you know, it has brought about a real feeling um, of empathy for those suffering more. And we see it in neighborliness, we see it in reaching out to those more deprived. All of these things will help us as we build back better in the words of the UN. So I'm just less depressed, but I know we have a big hill to climb. I'm glad you're less depressed, Mary. Um, and it's not actually, I, I think a word um, our, our sister Christiana Figueres often uses is stubborn optimism. And um, I think that's a mindset that is almost a necessary choice right now. 
Because let I, me ask let me, you. Let, let me ask you, Halla. I mean, you also have gone through these last few months in a particularly responsible position as CEO of the B team, which I'm also um, a B team um, leader member. Uh, you know, it has not been easy to, to navigate that. So how has it been for you? Well, thanks for asking. No, I think living in New York City has definitely been a transformative experience at this time, uh, you know, on a personal level. And um, because this has been the epicenter both of the pandemic, but also sort of a, a really big uh, location for the protests um, that have broken out and started with some violence and then have become very peaceful. And uh, I, for one, celebrate the fact that people are rising and saying enough is enough, both about uh, police violence, but I also think these protests are about a lot of different things coming together. You know, I, I know uh, Black Lives Matter, and we have to kind of stand there for uh, that, all of us, and try to understand and uncover this. And But I, I, I like to think about what's going on in the world as the most transformative time that I have experienced. And I thought I had seen it all in 2008 when Iceland experienced its infamous financial meltdown and the normally peaceful Icelanders took to the streets and started what is now called the pot, pots and pan revolution. That's violence in the eyes of the Icelanders because they were angry, the social contract broke, trust broke, and people got angry. But the level of violence, I'll be honest, in, in, in the setting of the U.S. is on another level. Uh, it mm. scares me in a way that the use of guns, the, the violence that's broken out, um, the violence that's been there in the culture of policing uh, towards black people is, is, is beyond probably my understanding. But I think it's moved all of us to really think about that after a moment of COVID that really did break us open. So I personally feel that as we took a step off the hamster wheel, I like to call it, we took a look at our own lives because of the pandemic pause. Those of us who could afford to do that because a lot of people still needed to serve on the front lines. And, but many people kind of stopped, took a step back, went into their home, took a look at their lives, took a look at our ways of working and took, a look at is the world really working and during this pandemic pause all of a sudden we saw to the bottom of the venice canals in in italy and we saw blue sky in cities that we hadn't seen before and and we saw our children more and we started understanding those of us with children in the home what a job educators have and how grateful we should be for them and healthcare workers and those who really matter and I think this transformed us as individuals and is transforming us as individuals. And then when we see people coming to the streets, not just in 50 states in the US, but in 100 countries around the world, and the solidarity in saying, we are not going back to business as usual. We have to acknowledge our sins of the past and really confront Black Lives Matter and actually confront a lot of things that are broken in our society. And this was the mission of the B team. B team was founded to say business as usual is no longer an option. So I have to say that I share your optimism that I have never seen a bigger opening to actually have meaningful conversations about the changes that we need to make happen in our society, in every part of our society. But I am also going to be honest that I have some fear and I sense some fear in people as well. Because as we see new power rising, and I'm a huge supporter of new power rising and all of us unleashing our own leadership in service of a better world, I think some of the old power is also going to rise. And I am concerned about violence. I am concerned about to what levels those who want to keep things the way they always have been will go. And part of me thinks that the new weapons of mass destruction are maybe not the same as they used to be. They are like misinformation. They are social media being used to spread false things, to maybe show and, 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 and encourage violence and things that I'm not in favor of as much as I am in favor of, of all of us rising to uh, let our voice and values be heard. How do you feel about that? Do you feel yeah. the fear too? I, I do, and I, I think you know a lot of those who are coming out for Black Lives Matter, for tackling inequality, housing, homelessness, 
uh, you know, the, all these different things, many of them no longer trust the private sector because they feel there's too much inequality and the social contract is somehow broken. What are you hearing from the B team that could be different language, different approaches that could actually restore a confidence that business is also part of the solution? I think this is so true. And I think actually trust in the private sector and in the world of finance broke in 2008, in my opinion, you know, yeah. and, and so it, and we just, we went back to business as usual then for the most part. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think some countries and some places made changes uh, that were meaningful, but for the most part, we rebuilt the things that fell upon us in 2008. And I, I can mean, just hope the that- The inequality increased dramatically. Inequality increased dramatically. Uh, you know, here are a couple of numbers that I've been thinking a lot about lately, and this is just from the COVID time. But before COVID hit, we, were, we had something like 115 million people at the brink of extreme poverty in the world. Now the estimated is somewhere around 265 million people at the brink of extreme hunger. Extre and, and this is serious. And during that same time, billionaires in America added something like 440 billion to their own wealth. And we're talking about a few months here. So inequality has increased on all levels and, and, and it's serious. I think what we've been doing on the B team since before this happened, B team has been around for seven years, is, has, has really come to the forefront now. And that is, we need a new vision for leadership. We can no longer accept uh, business leaders or any leaders who don't see it as their role to be in service of humanity. And you can't be in service of humanity anymore if you only are going to serve your shareholders. You have to take responsibility for the environment, for the sustainability of your environment. You have to take responsibility to address inequality. You have to take responsibility for governing and leading in transparent and trusted ways because there's no future beyond planetary boundaries for business or anyone else. There's no future with a broken social contract. I think we're seeing that now. And there's no future in a world where we don't trust anyone. So I, I think, and I think business knows this, and I think business was coming to know this over the last couple of years, but the pandemic pause sort of brought it to bear. Now, I'm not saying here that I think all business leaders get it, or are embracing this holistic and interrelated leadership that I think this moment calls for. But I see some real courageous leaders stepping forward. One that comes to mind, for example, is Emmanuel Faber, the CEO of Danone, the largest yogurt maker in the world. Um, Danone had already put its US operations in 2018 through a process to become so-called B Corporation, which is actually a corporation that holds itself responsible, not just for profits, but for environmental, social, and governance metrics and responsibility. And he now, in the middle of the pandemic, decided that he would put his whole global company to become a B Corp by 2025. His previous goal was 2030. So he pushed up the goal by five years. And, and I'm hearing more and more companies really thinking about this new way of leading for all stakeholders. And we need to raise those voices. We need to bring those voices together, which is what we're trying to do on the B team, because the way we've been leading has left us with a world in a mess. Hmm. No, it's very true. I mean, I, I, I'm very pleased that there's this sense of a contract with a wide range of stakeholders, not just serving the shareholders and the board and, and you know, in a narrow sense. Um, and, you know, I, I think this is going to be so important. I think so, Mary. And if you and maybe if I can, we can talk a little bit about what Dean Beersley said in the beginning about women in leadership. You know, you and I've been passionate about seeing more women in leadership for a long time. Um, and I think there is, you know, some truth to the fact that the world would be in a better place if we had more women in leadership. I saw that in Iceland in 2008 at my own company and in general, gender balance in leadership was helpful. And and and. I saw it in your leadership. You were a role model to me, to me as, as the former president of Iceland was a role model to you. You've shared that. So this also matters for other women leaders to step up. But is, this, is it possible, Mary, that this is not just about more women in leadership, but it's also about the ideas we have about leadership, that we think too much about leadership being about knowing all the answers, you know, being sort of the, the strong man, if you will. What do you think about that? I think it's true that uh, women lead 
quite often in a different way. And some men are also beginning to lead in this way, which I call a more problem solving, uh, less hierarchical, uh, more collaborative, uh, more in tune with the real issues on the ground that you want to solve. And I think one of the strengths of women leaders, I have found this, and I'm sure you have too, Hella, um, when I meet with you know, women who either have high office or have formerly held high office, very often what we do is we exchange uh, where we didn't do so well, our, you know, our kind of doubts about, you know, I could have done this better. Well, what do you, um, it's a very open engagement with, uh, instead of talking about our successes, we actually talk about things we wish we'd done a bit better. And, you know, I think we also want to encourage girls to be more confident, but in encouraging them to be more confident, I also want them to retain that sense of being able also to self-critique what they're doing, because that is a strength. Uh, it, you know, it's true that uh, boys jump in presuming they're qualified. I mean, this is a cliche, if you like, in a way, but it's true so often whereas girls wonder if they would be capable of doing it. Well, that transforms into a different kind of very interesting thoughtfulness in exercising leadership, which I think is really important. And it is a willingness to listen. It is a willingness to listen to the science, for example, as we're seeing with the women leaders now. And what we don't have is enough of a critical mass of women leaders to make that impact even more visible. But it, it actually will be more visible because of COVID, because those who've governed well will open their economies earlier and will be praised for managing. Those who took it too lightly, didn't take it seriously, had their own personal ambitions in the way, didn't want to know that or didn't want to listen to the science, it would be very cruel and devastating how many extra lives lost, how many extra people ill, how slow the economy, because there'll be a resurgence. You're seeing part of this at the moment in the United States, we're seeing it in Brazil, we're seeing it you know, where, where the leadership is not coping well. So is it possible, uh, and, and I'm absolutely sure we need more women in leadership, but is it possible that this is what we're learning is that humility is an essential leadership skill and hubris is actually possibly a deadly skill? Because I definitely think it was in Iceland in 2008, I think sameness and thinking you have all the answers and kind of being overconfident is actually more dangerous to me than what I typically see from women leaders and girls, which is a bit more of an underconfident approach. And maybe even most women I know have suffered, and I know I have, from the imposter syndrome, thinking, who am I to offer myself <laughs> to leadership? You know, am I qualified enough to have an opinion about this? And so is it possible that we're dealing with this sort of dimension of hubris versus humility and that humility, whether you're a woman or a man, is, is, is an essential leadership skill right now? I think it is in the sense of um, a kind of an awareness um, that you may be the leader, but you're on the shoulders of so many and you depend on the support and cooperation and collaboration of so many. And I think remembering that is a, is a very important part. When we were in Reykjavik together last August, when I was there for the sad memorial to a glacier that had become extinct, which was really, really sad. Um, you organized a meeting of women in, um, in Reykjavik. And I, I couldn't believe that, what was it, three or 400 women came together just like that within minutes. When you were campaigning and going forward for the presidency in Iceland, how important was it to link with, with women in doing that? It was incredibly important um, uh, for me to link to women, but also to the next generation. And, yeah. uh, and one of the questions I wanted to ask you, uh, I, I can start by sharing my own experience, but it's an interesting question of why someone decides to offer themselves for leadership and run for office or, or run for a big job, offer themselves for that. And I know when I was encouraged to run, the first reaction I had was, who am I? to run for president. The imposter was just really loud inside of me. And I actually spent a lot of time going around meeting other women who I thought should run for office because I cared enough about gender equality and Iceland's position in uh, the world as an equal, as, as, as a gender equality leader. We've I, remember, I remember we were on a school forum panel together. We you were. were a successful businesswoman 
and you told me, but I'm thinking of running for the presidency. And you asked me quite humbly, what do you think? <laughs> you know, I remember that very well. And do, you words, and do you remember, Mary, who was the one who told me I should do it? It was your husband, you know, and I told, <laughs> that told me something, you know, because I've always said, Mary, and this is a little mm. secret, but I think that some of the most amazing women leaders I've met, they also just have an amazing partner in life. It can be a great help, yeah. Though, yeah. mind you, Vigda Stimbogadotter, she did it very much on her own in that sense. And she and was a mentor to me when I was running for president. Exactly. She was well, the well, only that's... woman president in Europe. And when I said in Europe, people said, where? And I said, Iceland. <laughs> we, oh, Iceland was much less known back then, but this was 1980s. He's actually celebrating 40 years since he, mm. be, he was elected now. She just turned 90. And I know mm. we both love and adore her. Yeah. And I often share this story that, you know, from her campaign, because I do think it inspired me when I was 11 years old to even think about women becoming, um, running for office. Mm -hmm. But also the most profound story she shared with me was that when she had been in office for, um, I think, two, two four-year terms, a little boy came to her and asked her if boys could also become presidents. <laughs> and so that goes to show how norms shift when we have the role yeah. models. And after her, we had a male president for 20 years. So when I was running, actually, I met still, even in Iceland, the gender equality champion in the world, I met some gender barriers. I think they're still mm. there. I still think most of us, when we think of a leader, think of a man. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, uh, and think of masculine characteristics. So I've always been really passionate about trying to bring more feminine values, whether it's into finance or into leadership. Uh, and I think that's key because we, we need to, you know, we've been trained in business school and in sort of the rational economic man, which I'm not sure exists, honestly. But, uh, and I think we've seen the failure of that model. But we haven't been trained to say that and we are trained to compete really hard, but I don't think we're trained enough, at least those of us who study business, in understanding that caring deeply about our planet, about our people, about our communities, is as important as being able to compete hard. It's not an either or to me, but it is about expanding the definition of success. And this is what I think women leaders do. They expand the definition of success to include everyone, to, to be human, and not just serve the shareholder that Milton Friedman introduced 50 years ago. By the way, it's 50 years okay. since he introduced the theory that yeah. shareholder was yeah. the only one we needed to serve. Yeah. And I think it's past time that we announce formally that for the next 50 years, we need a different model. This one has yeah. failed us. Yes, I agree. And I think, uh, as we've been saying, COVID-19 really brings that out. And we, we cannot go back to that business as usual. We need to uh, change very much. And I think we need uh, to link far more uh, with nature and nature-based solutions. And uh, I think young people are becoming more and more aware of this in a very good way. Uh, I, uh, the chair, as chair of the elders, we've been linking with young climate activists. If you go into the website of the elders, um, we have blogs by young climate activists, and they are wonderful. And they're from all around the world. They're from Uganda, they're from Colombia, they're from China. And they, they bring out the diversity of that voice as well. And they are very holistic in their approach. And I, I, I really feel, and, and actually a significant number of them are women. We've, just, we've got a minority of, of male climate activists because most of the leadership of the Fridays for Future is, that, is, is young women. It's, it's been so interesting to watch that. And if we also take, we, we talk a lot these days about the pandemic and the protests. And, but if we take a look back, I think we've been, you know, we had the Me Too movement. We've had the Fridays for Future. We had even the 99% movement post 2008. In my opinion, what is being unleashed in the streets now is, is certainly Black Lives Matter about time. But it's yeah. about the phrase, I can't breathe, is about a lot of, things that people mm. feel like we can't breathe because of pollution. We can't breathe because we don't know how we're going to make ants meet. We, don't, we can't yeah. breathe because we feel like we're not safe from sexual harassment in, at work. We can't breathe because there's such poverty, extreme poverty and homelessness and suffering all around. And as human beings, this doesn't feel good to anyone. Yeah. But Mary, I know you've been, so, you've been one of the most courageous fighters for climate justice I have ever known. 
tell us the story of how you decide to run for president and then successfully become president and maybe what, what were your lessons? What lessons do you have for anyone listening who might be considering if they should run for office or offer themselves for leadership? Yeah, the interesting thing is uh, the presidency in Ireland, as, as um, in reality in, in Iceland, is a non-executive presidency. It's a moral voice. But if you're directly elected, as happens in Iceland and in Ireland, that greatly strengthens that moral voice. Uh, when I was approached by the smallest party that could nominate the Labour Party. I was an independent at the time, but I had for a while been a member of the Labour Party. And they came and they said, you know, we want to contest the next election. We want a good candidate. Would you consider? And my first answer was, look, I've got a wonderful life as a lawyer. I'm doing cases in Ireland. I'm doing cases in the European Court of Human Rights, the European Court of the European Union. And we've got three kids. Life is good. And I was disposed to say no. And actually, it was my husband who said, you know, you're supposed to be the great constitutional lawyer. Have you ever read the provisions about the presidency? And when I read them and read that kind of simple oath of, you know, doing my very best for the people of Ireland, you know, it, it was just a moral um, strength in that, in that um, uh, oath itself. And I thought to myself, well, you know, if they, if they would accept me as an independent, which was asking, not, not a Labour Party, I wouldn't rejoin the Labour Party, if they would accept me as an independent, I was prepared to make the case for a much more engaged president. So I started much earlier than the two men, the Deputy Prime Minister and the other male candidate of the other two parties, which were bigger parties. I started going around the country and I learned a huge amount about the Ireland of that time. And Ireland where there was a great deal of rural and community self-development because the common agricultural policy of the EU had helped the Irish economy. There was more money around, but there were not the facilities in towns and villages for children, for the elderly, for sports. So people were volunteering and it was an incredible time. And of course, I started to talk this up and learn what was happening on the ground. And somehow, I also learned to value hugely, which I hadn't up to then, the role of women who didn't have jobs outside the home. And there were a lot of them in Ireland at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was that community involvement, very locally, very quietly, um, doing for the others, doing you know, the meals on wheels, doing the... And uh, so when I was elected, uh, I, the most quoted quote of mine was to thank, and I use the Irish phrase, Mano Naheran, which was a pejorative term for these women who hadn't any role other than being mothers and in the home. So it was kind of dismissive, a bit like Sheila's, I think, in, in, in Australia, maybe a bit different, but it was pejorative, basically. And I thanked Manorna Heron, who instead of rocking the cradle, rocked the system, because they'd come out in more strength to vote um, for me. And um, I found that it gave me um, a much broader sense of who I would value as president, who I would try and visit and talk to. So um, I got letters from a lot of communities asking for a visit from the president. And I got advice that this was not important enough for the president. And I kind of got three or four messages of that kind. I thought, Who, who's deciding? And I decided I had a map and I pinpointed, you, you couldn't do everything and you wouldn't want to. But if I did strategically, um, for the elderly, for the handicapped, for the, I could cover a lot of ground. And that was a, a really strategic way of think. But none of this would have been possible without the enormous advice and support of those who supported me. I always feel, and it was from Archbishop Tutu, I learned this expression. You know, when you are the leader, you are on the shoulders of so many who have made that possible. So be humble. Mm. And you continue to model that so beautifully. But I'm thinking as you share how you went around and met the people. And I feel, as an Icelander, I felt like something happened after our financial collapse that made my, my country feel very split. You know, a cohesive culture all of a sudden mm. felt very divisive and angry. And I feel right now I live in divided states of America more than United States of America. And I'm just wondering, have we failed to listen to people? It, like, and what, how, if, if I had the magic pill and responded to my 18 year old son's request for an enlightened dictator in a world that feels broken, and I could give that to you. 
And I told you, Mary, you can actually decide what needs to be done to help bring this terribly broken world back together and address these great big challenges. Well, in a way, what my answer... My answer probably won't please your son in a way because it doesn't seem to be um, a specific answer, but it is. It's up to us. Um, I took part in a, a film the other day of the uh, Women's Lead Learning uh, Program, uh, which is a, a partnership, which is um, a, a partnership that I admire very much because it's completely bottom up. It's organizations, particularly in the Middle East and places like Bangladesh and Afghanistan, and they, all um, linking um, but not in a top-down way, in a bottom-up way, with the whole integrity of their organization, but sharing learning. So it's the Women's Learning Partnership. And they made a film about what's wrong with the world. And it's called, It's Up to Us. Mm. And I actually said at the launch, you know, that sounds very weak. But the point I was making at the beginning about COVID is interesting, because what are we doing? We collectively, by being compliant with what is requested of lockdown, social distancing, um, keeping away from people, which is very unnatural in many ways, but we know it's needed at the moment. We are learning that we collectively have a great potential strength. And I think the more we can recognize that, because what we need now is resilience building and resilience building in communities all over the world to be more able to cope with the health crisis, that comes with the economic crisis, with the education crisis, you know. Um, so I think it's no longer the strong top-down leader. It's the sort of sense of um, a bottom-up that's led well, that's gathered in and led well. And we, we don't need to reinvent wheels because fortunately in 2015, we got two very big frameworks. In September 2015, we got the 2030 Agenda for development with its 17 sustainable development goals. And I was there at the time with my mandate as the UN Special Envoy on, on climate change. And we got that because countries regarded it as voluntary and they could pick and choose which of the 17 goals they might or might not embrace. And then we got the Paris Climate Agreement, which was more or less voluntary. It was weakened as a treaty. It wasn't very strong. And then after that in 2018, in the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we got the voice of science. And to me, that voice of science is implacable, imperative. You can't argue with it, just as you can't argue with nature. And so we have to implement those frameworks. But fortunately, they're there and agreed by all countries. So even though we're in a bumpy time with a lot of um, you know, poor leadership, uh, essentially, we can move forward if we have this bottom-up pressure to do it. It's so interesting that you say that, Mary, and, and, I, um, and I think the question of resiliency, personal resiliency, organizational and societal resiliency is an interesting one. I, um, one of the most profound experiences I've had in my professional and, and sort of social organizing part of my life came after Iceland had its collapse, when we organized a national assembly to discuss the vision and values we wanted for mm. the new Iceland because everything yeah. we knew had collapsed. And we randomly selected people out of the national registry to participate in a dialogue about that. And it was probably one of the most profound days of my life, maybe after having my children and, and getting married to my wonderful partner. It was such a big transformative experience to see that as human beings, we agree a lot more than we disagree. Mm but we are sort of running around um, in systems, buying into norms that were created in a very different world. And now we need to kind of rise and embrace our own voice and values as human beings and help shape the world we live in. And this is what makes me so excited about observing the protests um, mm -hmm. and how people are rising and not giving up. It is time to end business as usual. Yeah. And it is time to rethink, reimagine, and reset yeah. um, us on a path to achieving those goals. The Paris Agreement, the global goals, or what we call on the B team, it's time to co-create an inclusive economy that actually works for humanity. Yeah. So I, I'm really excited about that. And now I see Greg popping on our <laughs> screen, and I, we're going to start opening up for questions. You're absolutely right. You've anticipated well. So um, 
we have an amazing uh, response from the people that are listening in and we have a bunch of questions. I'm gonna pose a couple, um, but for those of you that are with us right now, uh, some of you have already posted, others, please help us. We have this great opportunity with these leaders for another 20 minutes. Um, the first question I have really relates to one of your earlier pieces of, pieces of advice about humility and hubris. Um, ways that you could give advice to uh, leaders, male or female, particularly female, who are younger in their careers right now and who worry about showing humility and hubris, and especially if they are in organizations where that's not valued by their superiors. Uh, thanks to Karen Hennenberger for posting this question to us, please. Hmm. Do you want me to start, Mary? Yeah, you go ahead. And please build. Um, so I'm gonna be honest to Karen um, and everyone else listening. I would not have done anything in my life if I had waited until I was confident. So I've never been confident first. What I have found to be helpful for me is that when I care about something and I care deeply about a lot of different things, I muster up the courage to do something about it. And it's through practicing courage that I have found confidence in a few different fields in a very eclectic and serendipitous career. So I actually, and, and, and why do I raise that? I just think that instead of trying to figure out how do I become confident, like the mo model of leadership has sort of held up, the risk is that then you buy into the hubris syndrome that I actually think is a real cancer in leadership, uh, that you think you know it all, you think you have all the answers. But when you embrace courage, courage sits in the heart, I actually think you open up for being a human being who understands that um, we are all interdependent and no one person is going to be able to come up with the answer or the solutions or the leadership to solve great big global interrelated challenges. So my advice is really try to focus more on courage than confidence and try to figure out what you care about deeply enough because you can be really humble against these great big challenges without being underestimated because there's not a single person I have met who really knows how we solve climate change or COVID-19 or the protests and how people are feeling or our broken economic system. So I think humility is about respecting the fact that it is about all of us. It's up to us. Yeah, and just very briefly building, because I think you put that very well, Hala, I would say that if you are passionate and it's good to be, it's good to really feel very strongly, you will find there are others who want to go with you. And that's also leadership, bring people with you on the road. Um, and then, um, you know, that will make the difference. So it's, it's so Even powerful bring, bring to hear more you. women into, into a space so that you've got more of a critical mass. So it's not one woman trying to break one ceiling. It's, it's the kind of real bottom-up stuff that, 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 that wins through. No, both of these great advice. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question. Um, you've both been in situations where you've had to manage various forms of unrest, various forms of protest in your own roles and nations. Um, and as you did that, we're certain that you had individuals who might have asked to go quicker and individuals who might have asked for status quo. As the leader of the entire body politic, what advice would you have for those of us that are now facing certainly here in the US, um, these tensions that are playing out in the public sphere. Mary, you go first here. Okay, um, I think if you are um, in a position of uh, real leadership and that responsibility, I, I think you have to um, have cared enough about the issues to want to be a little brave, to want to be a little bold, because why else would you be there? Um, so I think, it is important to take brave decisions. I think we're going to have to take very brave decisions coming out of COVID, for example, because we're going to have huge debt in countries, and yet we're going to need a transition to um, a future. And so um, we're going to have to borrow at a time when people are saying, no, don't borrow anymore because you're so indebted. Um, but actually, if we're borrowing for a transition for the future of our children, I feel we're borrowing our children's money in order that they will have a good future. It's that kind of rather brave, um, uh, you know, brave debt 
um, that we should incur in order to have a good transition out of where we are now, because it has been so sudden, so devastating, and we have to navigate it well. I think that was so well put, Mary. I think the key I would like to add to that and then maybe bring in another perspective is that we have to make sure as we print money and essentially borrow money from our children and grandchildren as we do that, that we are using this money to invest in a more sustainable, equal, just, fair, better future. And I'm not sure we're doing that in every country, but it's been really interesting to see some examples where, for example, in Denmark, they refused to bail out companies that weren't paying taxes. I think there's some real, and, and in the EU now, um, increasingly directing um, the recovery packages at a green recovery, at a more inclusive recovery. So I, I think there are, you know, the leadership on that front varies quite a bit. And the thoughtfulness we put into the borrowing of money right now uh, it needs to be about the world we want to create, not the world we're coming out of, because then we will just build back business as usual. But I want to talk about the crisis of conformity, which I typically call the crisis of conformity that I think we have in leadership. And I think we have as human beings. It's so much easier to talk about restarting what was than it is to think about resetting, reimagining, rethinking. But... I think the greatest gifts that I think we were going to have to do this anyway, because the future of work and technological disruption, I think disruption is the new norm. Lots of jobs were going to go away uh, because of all of that. So why not use this time right now to really tackle our crisis of conformity, be it in the boardroom or leadership or in government and start rethinking and reimagining what kind of a world we want. Start dreaming, dreaming big. This is the moment. With artificial intelligence solving a lot of sort of basic jobs in our society, we actually could make more space for creativity to actually do things that really matter to us as human beings. We could even work less. We could reimagine the workplace, our own lives, our societies in very powerful ways now. And I think creativity is, is, is our given gift. It is something that everybody... Um, is here to, I, th I believe we, we are here to create. And so I see this as the greatest opening for that, but we have to make space for that. And I can definitely say that in Iceland, in the aftermath of its financial collapse, I, along with some courageous people, including our infamous pop singer Bjork and some really kind of out of the box thinkers were more ready to start reimagining Iceland than others were. And it is difficult often during a, era of trauma to get people to start being innovative because people have different levels of resilience. And so my one advice tying back to an earlier point we made is that I think we should look at hardship as an opportunity to bounce forward, whether we are individuals, organizations, or societies. When we go through hard things, the dark valleys that often come before the sort of really good periods have always been there before we've had good periods in history. And if we try to look at this moment and say it's difficult, it's hard, and we have to have compassion for people's ability to deal with it. But if we use it to bounce forward, to build back better, we will look back at this time and say, this is when we truly unleashed our humanity, our leadership in, in service of a better world. Greg, we can't hear you. Yes, that unmuting is a thing. Um, my next question involves really uncertainty. You know, markets really do not like uncertainty. They like to be able to predict what's going to happen. But we always know the only careful predictions are the ones that are retrospective. As the two of you have been so clearly thoughtful about um, dealing with what you don't know, could you say a little bit about managing the unexpected outcomes of your own decisions, recognizing that you made those, not knowing what would happen. And then if they didn't work the way you wanted, how did you manage that? Mary. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm thinking in a slightly different way about uh, the inaugural address that I gave as president. I was a non-executive president and I had uh, won the election in a surprise for Ireland, if you like. I mean, most people told me they cried when I was elected because it was such a 
such a change, etc. And in my inauguration, I, I set out a number of things that I hoped to do. Um, I hoped to be, for example, a voice for human rights, um, you know, not just in Ireland, but internationally. What on earth did I mean? Well, what, what, what on earth could possibly come of that? Um, I, I, I extended a hand of love to the communities in Northern Ireland. I use the word love. Now, I, 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 I use the term Northern Ireland, whereas a lot of people were talking about the North um, or the North of Ireland, but not the, the giving it the dignity of being Northern Ireland as a, as a place itself. And again, how on earth would I do it? And what was to me, um, if you like, surprising, but also encouraging was um, on all of those fronts, uh, things happened that enabled me to fulfill what were dreams of what I might be able to do as president. Um, in particular, on the international front, um, visiting Somalia in 1992, which I remember so well, uh, there was fighting between the warlords uh, for, uh, and food couldn't get to the feeding stations and the Irish development agencies begged me to go. And it was very harrowing to see long queues outside those feeding stations, children dying in the arms of their parents through famine, through food, um, food insecurity, and uh, to try and um, give some comfort, ignore the cameras, work my way through, etc. When I came to uh, speak about it at a press conference in uh, um, Nairobi afterwards, and I was faced with a whole, um, you know, 300 or so of the international press, I literally couldn't quite hold my calm and my voice because I was so angry with what I had seen and my voice began to break and I was very close to tears and I was kind of ashamed of myself because I was the lawyer. I should be able to advocate this and speak about it and do it properly. But of course it had far, far more impact. And I'm still slightly embarrassed, I must say, when I see that image um, years afterwards, but because it, it's very often played, it was a, it was a, a moment. Um, and then I went to see Boutros Ghali and he thanked me as the president of a small developed country for drawing attention to the horrors that a, an African country was suffering that nobody wanted to know about. So I, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question properly, but that was a very unexpected result that uh, my, what I felt critical about was my failure to keep calm and speak convincingly because my voice was breaking up was actually a much more powerful message. Oh, I think, Mary, what you just described there is you allowed yourself to dream big and be you at a moment that really mattered. And I think there's such an appetite for this kind of leadership in the world, this, to confront the crisis of conformity of what leadership is supposed to look like. And I think we're all a little stuck in that. And I think the story I would share, you know, first just acknowledging that uncertainty and disruption is the new normal. This is not the last pandemic, I'm sorry to say, and this one isn't over. These are not the last protests we will see. The, you know, technology is gonna disrupt our ways, weather events, we, we have the economic challenges that are coming with this are gonna be a challenge. Climate is even a bigger challenge for us and we cannot socially isolate from that. We have massive global challenges ahead. So I think if you wanna be in leadership, you need to figure out a way to manage that. And I think a lot of people are gonna always come to you and ask you why you're dreaming of a different world, because why wouldn't you just participate in the crisis of conformity and buy into a world that isn't working? Because you, know, you get well paid for doing that, you actually belong and, and get celebrated by many networks for doing that, and there's, you know, it's much easier to choose not to let your voice and values be heard even when you feel differently. So what I have found personally as the most helpful advice for me is I, I think we need a moral compass at a time like this. So one of the first things I did when I joined the B team was to help the B team leaders co-create the B team leadership compass to really get their minds around what needs to kind of sit on the inside as you navigate uncertainty and unthinkable events month after month as we're doing lately. And personally, I've always had one. I've developed it, but I'm, it's very clear, like I, I have a very clear answer to why I'm here and what principles are guiding my journey and I chose one specifically for the presidential run, which was a crazy, audacious idea that didn't come from me, but I eventually embraced because I wanted to respond to young people saying they wanted to talk more about the future they wanted and deserved. But, and, but I faced 45 days before election day. I had 1% in the polls. 
like the most humbling professional day in my life. And everybody asked me if I was going to quit, even my loved ones. And it was an incredibly challenging day on many levels, but it was also the best day because on that day I went deeper inside than the voices that kind of tell you, who are you to run? You don't have the support. It would be easier to throw in the towel. You're dreaming of something that people aren't ready for. Only the young people are ready for the vision and values you're proposing. Uh, the older people show up at the, and vote more than the young people. So just give up. Um, and I just went really deep inside. What do I care about? Why did I respond to this call for leadership? And I really unleashed that authentic, deepest voice of myself in that vulnerable moment of one percent day and went from being barely getting media time to becoming the runner up in the next 45 days by doing that. So I'm, I'm a huge believer in having a clear set of principles so that you have your own moral compass. And I'm a huge proponent of not trying to play a presidential candidate or president or CEO or a board director or a leader the way it's always been done but to do it the way you feel is authentically right and aligns well with what you care about, who you are, and what your voice deep, deep inside is telling you is right. So um, throughout, you too have come as advertised. You've been authentic and unscripted, um, which is absolutely what we were looking for. I guess with just the first, just amazing thank you. But in the last few minutes, um, you know, our audience really includes lots of people from the business sector wondering what they can do to step in in what are geopolitical issues. And you use the phrase, Hatla, no more business as usual. We couldn't have that anymore. Could you, either of you, be a little more specific about what you might think businesses could do? And you go first. <laughs> Well, Mary, you, I know you need to go off. Do you want to go first and then I can go so we can? Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll go because I, I have to go. Yes. Um, he has to go uh, at the minute. I'm willing to stay over if there's interest. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, there's no doubt we cannot continue with business as usual because we were not complying with the advice of climate scientists who were in, very clear uh, that we needed to reduce very significantly our greenhouse gas emissions and also the report on extinction of species, the need for nature-based solutions. And so I think that business people now um, need to uh, make a mental note of leading their companies um, in a way that conforms with the science and saying, my company is going to be zero carbon by 2050. The B team of leaders did that in January 2015 in Davos uh, to be net zero greenhouse gas emissions and do it the climate justice way with just transition. And I was so impressed by that commitment. That has to be the commitment now of all business leaders. And you have to be aware, therefore, of what this means, not only in your own corporation, but in your supply chain, in your sector. Um, you know, the whole approach um, has to be one that complies with the science because that's complying with the future for our children and grandchildren. And um, uh, I, I love the saying of Nelson Mandela, which I'll, which I'll end with um, as chair of the elders. He puts it very succinctly. It always seems impossible until it is done. I love that phrase. It always seems impossible until it is done. And um, we're in that exciting stage that you've described so well, Hala, where we actually have to now think in new ways, but um, know that every corporation, every city, every country has to make that commitment to be uh, green, inclusive, just transition by 2050 and work backwards from there. It's mm -hmm. been a wonderful conversation, Hala. I'm sorry I have to go, but they're, they're screaming at me around the corner. <laughs> Thank you for joining. And Mary, you amazing as always. I, I, I really appreciated you making the time with us today. Yeah, well, I Thank enjoyed you. as always being with oh, you. So me too. Talk okay. soon. Okay. Greg, maybe I can um, um, add to that a little bit. Uh, so I think it's time for a new definition of success in business. And the way I like to think about it, and I think roughly speaking, we might use different language and different measurements, but roughly speaking, leadership that doesn't embrace environmental, social, and governance responsibility alongside profit 
is going to fail. Like it, and why is that? We, we see, for example, half of Harvard MBA students, sorry to mention that on a UVA call, but half of them have lost faith in capitalism. A course on reimagining capitalism that used to be on the sidelines of Harvard is now the most sought after course in Harvard's MBA program. Young people have already decided that working for a business that is in the pursuit of financial profit only is no longer their desire. Some may do it because they have to, but they are on their way to do something that they care about. They want purpose-driven and principled leadership from business. So if you want to attract the talent, which is at the heart of any business, you have to do it. If you want to be relevant and manage risks, like the climate risks, like the risks that are happening to the reputation of companies that are not doing this, if you want to have loyalty from customers and consumers that are thinking like this, you just have to really incorporate a much more responsible social lens. And I think that's really coming through in the protests now. And at the end of the day, I think governance needs to change from being about serving the shareholder to being about serving all stakeholders. And the way I like to think about this, and this is being driven by the world of investments now, it is ESG, which everybody knows now as environmental, social, and governance responsibility. But I like to think about ESG cubed to give you one mathematical formula for the business people online and, and the MBA students. I like to think about ESG cubed because I think there are three parts to each of those letters that are really profound, in my opinion. Under the E, we have to do right on climate. We have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, no doubt. We also really have to think about how we um, bring in nature-based solutions, which I don't think we've been thinking about enough. That's probably about a third of the answer. So I think nature-based solutions is the second sort of pillar, including agriculture, food, and land use, and a lot of those issues that are very near to us and have actually played a role during COVID. People who have worse health, it appears, are more likely to die from it. And I think that has something to do with this. And science seems to be supporting that early days. And last but not least, we need to try to figure out how we become more circular. So not just uh, use and throw away uh, consumption. We need to actually create more circular uh, use of all of our resources. So okay. those would be three E pillars I would really think about. On the, under the S, I think there are three pillars again. One is human rights. I don't think you can get away anymore with the human rights violations. I think human rights due diligence is gonna become the new norms and the most aggressive companies, including Unilever that was led by the chair of the B team for 10 years, has really taken a strong look at its supply chain and its responsibility. The second piece is diversity and inclusion. Unless you really think about how you bring the value of all voices, women, Black Lives Matter, LGBT plus rights, like you really, un people with disabilities or disabilities, as I would like to call it, people who have a difference to bear are actually valuable. You should surround yourself with people who share your values but are different in every other way. That's one of the sort of people advice I always give because that's where innovation, creativity, and good debate and dialogue happens. And that's where progress comes from, not from sameness. Sameness is dangerous. So that's the second pillar. Third pillar is really shared prosperity. What are you gonna do as a business to address the fact that people have woken up to a world that is so unequal that it doesn't resonate anymore? Are you going to disclose your pay ratios? Are you going to commit to a living wage? Are you going to um, do a bit to correct some of the inequality, financial inequality that is leaving so many people behind? And then if I go to the G, which I think about the governance levers that can address these two chief crises of our environmental and climate crisis and our crisis of inequality, is we need to shift from the shareholder governance model to a stakeholder governance. And that there's interesting experiments been done through benefit corporations and other ways of, of incorporating that I think are going to become a lot more common in this next decade. Second, I think we really need gender balance because I think gender helps us expand to the definition of success. And so when we have a greater gender balance and of course ethnic balance and, and diversity in general, more inclusion, I think our definition of success changes to reflect the world we live in. So I think that's critical. And last but not least, I think we need to take a generational lens to our leadership and how we run our businesses.
we really need to start thinking about our accountability in, uh, through the lens of uh, the next generation and the world and mess we're leaving them with. And it is no longer okay to say, I'm just gonna do one good philanthropic thing here or stand for one good thing. As a leader, you need to stand up and live up to all of those things to remain relevant, to grow your business and take advantage of incredible opportunities and to avoid big risks that have become bigger and are becoming bigger. So that would be my ESG cubed would be the formula I would uh, put to all of you who are thinking about um, this and, and really start figuring where are you on, 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 on thinking about incorporating that in what you measure, what objectives you're setting, what you disclose, because that is probably going to become the new norm, hopefully soon, but at least within the next decade and business leaders as all leaders have to think long term. What I love about that answer is its specificity. <laughs> so often, I, no, I, I think so often what we become accustomed to is statements that happen about what you should do or the way you might normatively think that are relatively hollow. Um, and so what I, what I really appreciate, and I'm sure the rest of us do, is that you've been really thoughtful throughout. You've been authentic, you've been open, you've been candid, you've been humble, but, but then to close with something that says, not only do we need to think about ESG, we need to be specific in what we mean by that. Mm. Very, very powerful. Um, so it's, it's now to me to thank everyone for being here. Um, this has been the type of event that we would have imagined, the type of tone and content hot lead that we talked about um, and what we wanted and, in so many ways, you inviting uh, Mary to join us is just a wonderful gift. Um, we're having a global event, um, and not just Mary. We know that there are people that are with us right now in India. There are people that are with us right now in China. Forget about time zones and space. We are having types of conversations that we intend to be in. And so for all of you who came, for all of you who gave us questions, to all of you who will have questions after this, Leadership Unscripted is a continuing discussion, and um, we intend to continue to be uh, connected to you. So on behalf of Dean Beersley, on behalf of the University of Virginia, on behalf of Laura Martins, my partner who helps pull all these together, we just want to thank all of you. And uh, please have a great day. <laughs>